chief. What it said at the best is from Northern California. He told me that self self-sufficiency is self-determination. He says relying on the federal government to take care of us are, is not self-determination. That's not self-sufficiency. When we can support ourselves and tell the feds, well, okay, maybe that's what you want to do or what you think's right, but guess what? We got our own money and we're doing this. That is self-sufficiency. opportunities that are occurring in the United States is that the more business the tribal government take on, the more programs that tribal governments run, the more they hire their own people, the more improvement of the human capital is going on. Native peoples in the United States are gaining job experience, managerial experience, financial experience, and are gaining the capability of being entrepreneurs one day and are seeing the, the value and the possibility of starting their own businesses. So the world of entrepreneurship for native people in the United States is opening. Well, I think you can't look into the future uh, in, in Indian country, as some First Nations people would have it, uh, without looking into the past. And I think that's going to be the exciting thing about the future of, of uh, Indigenous entrepreneurship, at least in this part of the world, is that people are going to find ways to build on their traditional ways of doing things ways that respect the closeness of their families, the interconnectedness of their communities, and yet work in today's world. I don't know if you might be familiar with the Haida manga, but you know, mangas are Japanese comic books, and, and the Haida have told some of their stories using the form of a, of a Japanese manga, uh, but using the, uh, the traditional Haida style, using ovoid art. And for me, that's a kind of symbol of the innovation that we'll see as Indigenous people build on their traditions, take advantage of the strengths of their culture, but build on international examples of things that work um, and adapt them for their own purposes. I think one of the biggest opportunities for future Indigenous entrepreneurs is to recreate and reconnect the uh, connections between Indigenous business owners, so to rekindle Indigenous economies, to create that Indigenous to Indigenous trade that was once present for contact and has still been present in some ways, but to really reassert that, resurge it, and to really redevelop those connections. The idea of combining uh, Aboriginal language and culture with uh, technology and utilizing a digital media as a platform for new ways of communicating uh, and sharing language and culture. And I think there's there's definitely some inherent opportunities within that realm. We have our council um, and our chiefs that advocate for our entrepreneurs when they're engaging potential partners or outside um, businesses. So then the entrepreneurs can then look forward to promoting themselves to these outside businesses and to the, these governments. I think there's a lot of opportunities for the RFPs, request for proposals out there um, with so many different corporations, businesses and governments that they it's just up to them to do the research and to do the hard work and the groundwork to put themselves out there and to get involved in all of these opportunities. You know, now I'm in the EMBA program and learning a bit more about business and opportunity and uh, I'm really working on inspiring our youth to start businesses but not limit themselves to starting businesses on reserve. I want them to look at starting businesses in Whistler, Pemberton or Vancouver, you know, whatever their idea is, they need to think where's the best place for their business. Just like uh, Charles Eden Shaw, the artist, and Bill Reed incorporated non-Indigenous aspects into their work, we'll see Aboriginal business people take what they think is useful that works for them and adapt it to their way of thinking and their way of doing things uh, to be successful in business.